Hi, Dr. Karen Lawson with Fundamentals of Health Coaching 1, continuing in our uh, Week 7 Explorations of Holistic and Integrated Perspectives on Health and Healing, um, Part 2, as we explore constructs of health and disease. So this um, presentation will draw heavily from the work of Dr. Uh, Larry Dossey, D-O-S-S-E-Y, as well as um, the work of Elliot Dasher, um, and many, many minds who have contributed, particularly in the 90s, to um, giving us some larger conceptual understanding of the evolution of modern medicine, which really, I think, helps us understand where we are now because we know how we got here. So one framework um, is this looking at the eras in which modern medicine evolved from. That first era being in the mid-1800s to kind of the mid-1900s. So really from the time that the AMA came into being until we got through World War II. Um, and during that time, it really was the epitome of the world kind of as a mindless machine. Um, it was all about the physical operations. And consciousness was felt really to be a byproduct of the physical brain. Um, and nothing less than that and nothing more than that. Um, and so the focus all was on the physical, um, the support of and the healing of the physical. In that, during that time, which is also called technocratic medicine, um, the mind and the body were really seen as separate things um, with, as I mentioned, the body is a machine. And in the um, patient-physician relationship, the patient was really seen as a passive recipient, and there was very clear separation of the patient and doctor. The two didn't really directly um, impact each other, other than um, what the doctor gave to the patient or did to the patient, but as um, oh, organisms, they really were completely separate. There was also a very strict hierarchical uh, structure of the organizations, and the movement was to try to standardize care. Um, I can speak from personal experience in that my parents, who were both Depression era, um, you know, born and raised in the Depression era, and my father fought in World War II, and so this um, in this period of time, they kind of learned their way of engaging with the medical system. And even right up uh, well into the early 2000s, um, they still played very much the role of passive, passive recipient with their health care. They did not think it was their place to ever ask a physician a question. The, the physician's time was the most important thing. There was no problem with waiting for two hours to see the doctor. Um, and but that you would never take more than a moment of the doctor's time, um, that it was a very hierarchical and separate relationship. And it was a struggle for me um, in the era in which I was raised to watch that still persist even as the culture around us has evolved. And I think that that's still true for some of the um, elderly folks that are still alive. Um, in this technocratic medicine, again, the responsibility and the power was all with the physician. Um, there was a kind of a supervaluation or an overvaluation of the brilliance of science and that science would give us every answer and a lot of aggression with interventions and focus on short-term results. I think this really has led us to the place where we spend the, the greatest amount of our health care dollars by far are spent in people's last 25 days of life because we're aggressively trying to prevent death, which is not very effective. Um, the focus of this kind of medicine is really on stopping symptoms and minimizing disability. Um, there are there really isn't um, any role for a discussion of healing, and there was no place or understanding for really a larger discussion of health. Death was seen as the enemy, therefore, for a physician to let a patient die was a failure um, and was to be um, avoided at all costs. And the system was really a profit-driven system. So there was intolerance of other modalities, other approaches, and other um, cultural sensitivities. So we began seeing this shift, and again, depending upon where you lived, what part of the country, what your culture of origin was, 
Um, that shift happened anywhere from the mid-1900s to it's still happening um, in some small rural towns and particularly in conservative climates and um, the south and actually parts of the east coast in particular. Um, it's very, very entrenched and it's um, having a hard time. Some places haven't really completely even got to this. Um, but for the most part, where medicine is now conventional mainstream medicine is, is that we have an understanding of the mind body connection. So we're beginning to understand some thoughts around mind body medicine. We have validated uh, the recognized placebo response, though we still don't optimize it. And we do recognize that there is a stress response and there's a way to impact it and that there are impacts from positive thinking and positive psychology. The science of psychoneuroimmunology um, is recognized and has an impact to some extent on our practice of medicine today in this kind of era to medicine, which is also the, called humanistic medicine. So in humanistic medicine, which people I think are beginning to feel more comfortable with, the mind and body are connected. The body is an organism, a living, breathing, growing, evolving organism rather than a machine. And so we're gaining... Um, even understanding of the various uh, expression of our genetic code that we have based upon our everything from our diet to our beliefs, um, to our thoughts. And I think that's going to be a real game changer because it comes out of our own science. Um, we have acknowledged the power of relationship and the patient as a relational subject. Um, although most of the time the impact is, is looked at as how the physician impacts the patient with very little consideration of the impact of the patient on the physician. Um, there has been um, intentional conversation and professional study around relationship-centered care um, for almost 20 years now. And so that is growing in recognition and validation. And we're beginning to try to find a way of balancing the institutional drivers and the individual. Although I think we kind of dance in and out of our ability to do that. There's more of a shared responsibility in this kind of medicine between the doctor or the caregiver and the patient. Um, so the patient is being charged with taking on a bit more of the responsibility. And we're endeavoring to find some balance between the science and the technology with humanism. Um, beginning to recognize that some of our practices are not only not serving us economically, but they're not serving the um, highest good of the individuals or the families involved. The focus of this kind of medicine, humanistic medicine, is still really on the curing of illness and disease. Um, and where a cure is not believed possible, the removal of symptoms or the suppression of symptoms and we're beginning to have valid conversations around prevention, recognizing the impact of lifestyle and behaviors, and um, that people's choices in their life leads to a lot of the chronic disease situations um, that have become so prevalent in our culture. Uh, we have begun to recognize more of the acceptability of death, although um, there's still a lot of stipulations around when that is true, but that has led to a growing hospice movement, um, better possibilities for people making living wills and making intentional choices about how they wish to intentionally approach their death. Um, and it's a moving area, but one I think that is evolving in the right direction. Um, there is an increased focus on compassion and recognize the importance of the, um, again, that nature of compassion that's necessary for relationship to happen between any kind of caregiver and the client or patient. And it has begun slowly to lead to more open-minded exploration of choices and therefore a movement from alternative medicine now beginning at least to move into the area of integrative medicine so that we can explore how all of these things come together and can work to support and optimize each other. The third um, category, I guess, in this idea of the evolution of medicine is era three, um, which, depending upon where you live, um, is either currently dawning or it's just around the corner, we hope, um, but really is sometimes still the conversation in, I would say, the the smaller number of um, kind of more fringe consciousness explorers, um, 
areas that like the Institute of Noetic Sciences that have been looking at this type of non-local conscious impact now for um, over 15 years. Um, so there's a recognition of spirit being something that's non-local or infinite, greater than the individual um, being, and that because that consciousness is not local, there is the ability for it to impact change over time and space, which really is in alignment with our understanding of prayer, um, but also now shifts our conceptual idea of how healing can potentially work. Again, we're, I think, in the very earliest dawn or pre-dawn of this area, um, and, and a very exciting time um, for us to try to see how we can help support and move the current predominant paradigm um, really into era three. Era three is holistic medicine, which is really, a, in a way, coming full circle back to the um, type of medicine that first started in the Western world, um, you know, 2,000 years ago, and really has been part of healing traditions um, in many places for over 20,000 years. So this is the unity of mind, body, and spirit and the interconnection um, between people because of the recognition of the body as an energy system and all energy systems connect. So the focus in holistic medicine is on focusing the whole person in the context of their life. Um, and the focus here is on healing rather than on curing. What that means really is, is a, a healing is moving into our most optimal our most optimal way of living and being at whatever state that we are in. Some of the greatest healings I have seen with individuals have happened within a couple days of their death, sometimes within a couple hours of their death. So um, it's not a contradiction to people actually even having um, infirmity or um, being challenged by disease. There is still an opportunity for a healing of the, of the greater whole. There's a recognition of the unity um, of the practitioner and the client and um, an acknowledgement of the fact that the client has impact back on the practitioner as well. And it's moving more toward a circular or network type of organizational structure rather than a hierarchical one. Um, ideally, it's also leading to a belief that the individual really is responsible um, for not in a burdensome way, but in an empowered way for their own health and life experience, while we simultaneously recognize that there's really no separation between the provider and the, the client. This is leading to really a radically new science. As you read Ballantyne, I think that's probably the, the first book that came out now, going on 20 years ago, or 15 years ago anyway, um, really looking at what science is and what is a, a radical understanding and application of science which will be of greater service to humanity. Um, the focus of this kind of science really is on health promotion and again healing is a return to wholeness with disease being acknowledged as a potential transformative force. Um, as I've watched this in action, you know, I've seen individuals, both friends as well as um, patients and clients, you know, be able to tell me after they've gone through a course of an illness that that heart attack or that cancer was the um, greatest teacher and the greatest opportunity that they ever had. And they are um, in a new place in their life that they would never have been had that disease not happened. Um, so that moves us into a place of um, seeing our bodies and our experience as messengers and um, allowing for it to lead us toward the um, evolution and transformation of our own uh, spiritual experience. In this kind of a process, death is now a natural step. Um, it's not something to be feared, um, but something to be acknowledged as being um, just a part of our life um, process. And really, uh, this allows us to embrace the widest multiplicity of our options for our own health and healing. So this is to give you an opportunity to kind of see it in a, um, a visual um, as we've evolved, as I know that sometimes the, the visual learners like to be able to kind of see how it lines up. And again, there are not hard dates on this. Um, and I know that on many days I 
struggle to believe that we're even beginning um, era three, but I think that it is happening. And this is just a reminder um, that really, this really isn't about achieving an endpoint or getting somewhere. It's about being in the process. Holism is not an event. Um, I love the, the statistics that the space shuttles, when they fly, are off course 99% of the time because they're perpetually tacking back and forth, getting back on course, getting back on course, doing course correction, moving forward. It's not about getting on course, getting on track and staying there. It's about being in the steady process of continually reevaluating, reassessing, and making intentious, intentional sorry, choices forth uh, with our consciousness about how we want to be living our lives. So here's my slightly sarcastic comment about what holistic medicine is not. I'll let you read the cartoon for yourself. But many people today talk about, oh, this is holistic because it uses a natural product. Or this is um, holistic because I'm, I'm adding two things together. And adding things in is really not what holism is about. At some level, I suppose theoretically, this begins to address the integrative. Um, but it really is doing it in a very reductionistic way. So the challenge for us is to hold the larger vision and the larger container of what it is that we're living and evolving into. Because it's the choices that we make um, for ourselves and for our clients um, that, and the choices that we support them in making that will really allow each one of us to create our 